Raw Truth, Stories of Female Infidelity may contain explicit and questionable content. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual podcaster Rebecca Adams and are not based on the advice of a licensed therapist, psychologist, or psychiatrist. Listener discretion is strongly advised. What does ponder actually mean? Well, according to the dictionary, it means think about something carefully, especially before making a decision or reaching a conclusion. Well, as you know, on the Raw Truth Stories of Female Infidelity podcast episodes, we allow women to share their stories in a non judgmental way about why they stepped out of their relationships. But there are so many other interesting topics that we all need to learn from and not to judge right away. So let's talk about it now. Let's ponder. Hello and welcome to Let's Ponder on Raw Truth, Stories of Female Infidelity. This is Rebecca. Hope everybody is doing well. I'm sitting here recording this quickly because I was out of town this last weekend, as some of you might have seen on Facebook. My daughter and I went to Las Vegas, and it was fun. We went about a year and a half ago before the COVID, or right as the COVID stuff was getting um, more... I don't know what the word is I want to use. (laughs) Basically, when we left in March of 2020 on our way back, they were shutting the strip down completely and the lights were out by that night. Um, And of course, it was a lot different this time. And uh, but this time, apparently, when I booked the room and everything was expensive, I went with the least one that I could find, you know, that's in the center of the strip, just because that's, I like to be in the middle, I don't want to be from one end to the other, because, you know, it's forever and a day walking. And uh, we stayed at Bally's. So my daughter, of course, went back and did history checks on the place. And so not only was it the original MGM when Vegas was built, but there was a fire down at the bottom floor in a deli and all this um, toxic smoke from all the things that were burning down there because they had a lot of velvet (laughs) back in the day. This was back in, I think, 1980. But when they built it, you know, it had that Vegas velvet 70s thing going on and all the fumes were going up through the um, through the building, up, up, up all the floors, and many people died, mainly from the toxins and smoke inhalation. Nobody really burned to death. There may have been a couple of people, but it was all that. And of course, she's telling me you want we want to be either on floor fifteen or above floor twenty three or something like that. She's like, be on fifteen. Um, or not 15, maybe 16, anything 15 and below. And then, I don't know, it was funny. Anyways, um, we were on the 23rd floor, and I was able to look back in the history and find out that thankfully nobody had passed away in the rooms that we were in. Um, But you would walk by the rooms and know that somebody had lost their life innocently, and it's heartbreaking. And I understand it was 40 years ago, but it's still sad. So we did that. um, And it ended up being, get this, to fly out of Portland to Las Vegas. It was a weekend. There was apparently a bunch of events happening. And for the airfare and the room was $1,800 for the two of us. 18 freaking dollars. And (laughs) When we got to the room, we thought, okay, well, if we're going to end up paying 450 bucks a night on average with the tax and the resort fee and all that other crap, um, you'd be pretty nice rooms. And I've stayed at the Cosmopolitan, and that is swanky. That was amazing. Bally's, I was so disappointed. The amount of grime on the back of the door by, like, the door hole or the... Um, the door hole, <laughs> the view hole, you know, peeking out, whatever that's called. And um, the dust on like even in the bathroom, the toilet paper roll, it's like nobody had wiped that down. The brown grime on the curtains. 
and chipped paint all in the bathroom. And I'm like, what the hell? You know, I think I have a better, it's nicer at a freaking Motel 6 with less bumps and crap and all sorts of stuff. And bumps meaning, I guess, scrapes and crap. I don't know why I said bumps. But anyways, um, so when I checked out, the gentleman said, well, we sure hope you enjoyed your stay. And I said, you know, we were disappointed in this room. Uh, you know, considering it was $450, uh, you know, this and this and this. And he said, I know we, 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 the prices are high this weekend because of such and such. And our rates are normally not over or they are around $100. But next time you come into town, call me about a week ahead of time and I will upgrade your uh, room at no charge. So I appreciated that. But I had just booked a trip um, to go back in May for my son's 21st birthday and my daughter will join us in the Marine. And to, to book for, uh, for the four of us, a room at Caesars Palace, uh, round trip airfare was the same 1800 but for four people not just two. And of course, it's during the week, so it's less expensive. But I just was like, uh, I don't think I want to stay here again, just because it's kind of got spooky history. And if any of you listening are like true crime buffs or anything like that, you might check that out. That might be something to do a fun podcast about. Um, but I want to experience something new. And my son couldn't stop smiling. He is so excited. And then after I paid for that, I upgraded our air flight, our airplane seats. So we're in premium. So it ended up costing a little more, but there's more leg room and you can get a free beer or whatever you want. And, and so of course, my daughter was on board with that. And uh, yeah, it's uh, the Marine, since he said, well, if I'm going to have to uh, wear a mask on the plane, which you do, I think I'm going to need a drink because he's so frustrated with the masks and all of that. So anyways, that is where I was at this last weekend. And tomorrow at 7 a.m., October 27th, I will be in having surgery. So I'm rambling this off here, trying to get it done and trying to get ahead of myself since I was out of town, officially retired from my work, done with my Vegas trip, and now I'm going to get the breast reduction and I cannot wait. I'm excited and scared all at the same time. So send me positive thoughts. By the time you hear this, um, my Patreon listeners are going to get this on October 29th, and the rest will get it on Halloween. Um, it will be done and over with, and I will be hopefully in good shape. So anyways, just kind of a little heads up about what's going on in my world here this crazy week. On Raw Truth, Stories of Female Infidelity, I share stories of women who have been unfaithful to their spouse or partner. I provide them with a safe place to be able to explain what happened and why they chose the direction of infidelity. If you have been through this, whether it be because you were unfaithful or you were betrayed, you know that you just can't open the topic for discussion with your family and friends. It can be very lonely to process it all on your own. I know from my own experience when I was being unfaithful, the emotions that can all be too consuming. These reasons are why I chose to create this podcast. I don't condone infidelity, but it happens, and I refuse to place judgment on anyone. But I also feel it is just as important to learn what the husband or partner endures when this truth is revealed. What was it that led him to feel suspicious of her? How did he find out? How did he process all of this and what would he do next? How could he confront her? About five minutes later, I'm still not sleeping, but I hear a conversation on the phone over the music. I heard Becky on the phone, but her voice was different. It had a slower, seductive sound to it with a smile on her face. It wasn't a normal phone voice for her. At this point, I was wide awake and realizing something was going on. When I heard her say, I'm just wearing a bra, I decided to see what the hell was going on out there. I walked out to her in the living room 
lying on her back on the carpet, pillow behind her head, phone in one hand and the other hand down her pants. I was stunned. She saw me and froze. She said to the other person on the other end of the phone line, Well, my boyfriend is up, so I'm going to let you go. And she hung up. I asked what this was all about. Who was that on the other line? She told me she was talking to her cousin. I said, your cousin asks you what you are wearing often? By subscribing to Raw Truth Stories of Female Infidelity on Patreon, you will get to hear these stories from the husband or partner's point of view as they share their side of the betrayal. Has your wife or partner been unfaithful? Have you not had anybody to really talk to about it? You're not alone. Perhaps you might even want to share your side for the show to help others. Visit rawtruthstoriesoffemaleinfidelity.com and select Patreon to subscribe. Pledges start at $3 a month for the No Judgment tier. Not only do you get two extra stories a month, you get early access to the regular Raw Truth Stories ad-free and my outtakes. When you select the I Love This Podcast tier, which is $5 a month pledge, not only will you receive everything in the No Judgment tier, you will receive a No Judgment bracelet and an acknowledgement on a future Raw Truth episode, first name only with your city and state. Okay, so we should get on with today's episode. Plus, it's Tuesday, so it's Taco Tuesday, and I got to go take care of that. So, uh, I better get my ass moving here. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about sexless relationships. I had put out some uh, requests just trying to understand um, sexless relationships and what that means to certain people. How are they dealing with sexless relationships? Is it them? How, you know, all those types of things. And of course, I did find an article to share. Um, and I will have that link to this original article online on my episode notes. But it's called, Should You Stay in a Sexless Relationship? And after um, I read this article, I will be able to share with you some little short stories that people shared with me in regards to their relationships and being in a sexless marriage. Should You Stay in a Sexless Relationship? by Stacy Laura Lloyd, updated on 319.21. Sex can play a different role in many relationships. What goes on behind closed bedroom doors can vary from couple to couple or even change between the same couple over time. Even further, your definition of a healthy sex life might not be exactly like your partner's. So, how can you tell if the lack of sex is harmful to your relationship? Our views about sex are influenced by many factors, and it's hard to know what's normal when comparing your love life to those of your friends, or the extravagant displays of passions we see in the movies. There are several reasons you might find yourself in a sexless relationship. Some couples become less intimate over time, while others have less sex from the beginning. You may even wonder if you should leave, but if something has changed between you and your partner, there are many ways to revive the spark. The first step is taking a look at your relationship to understand why you're not having as much sex as you want. Read on for therapists Isadora Allman and Susan Krauss Whitbourne's advice on how to approach a sexless relationship. Meet the expert. Isadora Allman, MFTCST, is a board-certified sex therapist and licensed marriage and relationship therapist in California. Susan Krauss Whitborn, Ph.D., is a professor at the University of Massachusetts, that was hard to say, sorry, Massachusetts Amherst. Why is your relationship sexless? It's not uncommon to go through different stages in your love life. For some couples, it's normal to be less intimate, while others may see a decline over time. If you're wondering whether a sexless relationship is healthy, you'll first want to understand what's causing it. Examine your relationship from a few different angles. Are you feeling too busy and struggling to find time for intimacy? Or does it feel like your emotional connection with your partner is fading? When life gets in your way, you might find that you're not as close to your significant other as you used to be. Sometimes we simply fall out of the habit, 
quote, This happens more often than you think. Some event like an illness or a new baby will interrupt the couple's normal sexual schedule, supposedly temporary or temporarily, but sexual relations just don't resume. End quote, says Allman. If sex stops once children enter the picture, some couples find it challenging to view their partners as sexual beings rather than just parents of their kids. Quote, the sexual drought continues, and quite commonly, nobody brings the topic up until it becomes critical to one or the other. The situation can last for years. End quote. When sex is seen as a chore, it's important that both partners make time to be intimate. After all, sex is an essential part of connecting with the one you love most, and getting back in bed together can be exciting after some time away. In sexless relationships, it's important to talk openly with one another to communicate what you both need and seek help when it's necessary. In other cases, a sexual relationship comes in different forms. One partner may no longer feel turned on by the other, or they may not desire sex because they're attracted to someone else. Quote, the complainer usually gives a reason, such as a partner's weight gain or unwillingness to engage in the type of sex they prefer, says Almond. Quote, a person can learn to love the partner again by focusing on what is lovable, what originally turned them on, or what might be changed that might reawaken love and desire. There are also couples who never treated sex as a key component of love to begin with, and they may view their partner as a companion rather than a romantic mate. Some people are fine with living in a sexless relationship. The key is ensuring that both partners are on the same page. On the contrary, other couples lose sexual desires for one another after infidelity. Broken trust can also break the desires to be intimate going forward. How important is sex in a relationship? While many of us love sex for its obvious physical benefits, it's also an important part of connecting emotionally with our partners. Many people view the desire and frequency of sex with their mate as an analysis of how healthy the relationship is. When we are intimate with our partners, we strengthen a unique emotional bond that comes with being physically close to one another. But how often we have sex doesn't always measure our happiness, and like all other things in love, our desires can only be defined by ourselves. I think often what is being asked when the, quote, how important is sex question is posed, quote, how often should my partner and I have sex in order to be considered normal, end quote, says Allman, once a year, once a day, if whatever is happening between them is sufficient sex, there is no problem. Asking for outside validation is irrelevant. End quote. In other words, as long as both partners are happy, there's no need to compare the frequency of your sex life to others. When you've suddenly lost the desire or are rarely intimate with each other, this may be an indicator that your connection is failing. Uh, quote, if a couple is celibate because their sexual relationship was unsatisfying or unfulfilling, then it stands to reason that they will experience high levels of sexual dissatisfaction, end quote, says Whitbourne. Quote, emotionally, a couple may remain together in a sexless marriage because their partner is their best friend or their ideal partner. That's not to say that you'll be stuck in a sexless relationship forever. If you're not getting what you need, consider discussing the topic with your significant other. There are plenty of ways to improve your sex life when you're in a rut. How important is sex to you? Your happiness in a sexless relationship depends on what you need as an individual. Even if your partner is perfectly fine with less intimacy, your desires are still an important part of keeping a healthy balance. You'll need to assess how important sex is to you before deciding whether your partner can meet your needs. For some people, sex is an absolute necessity in a relationship. A romantic situation where sex is rarely an option is off the table. For others, having an emotional connection with their partner is enough to sustain a meaningful, successful, and long-lasting connection. Some people even opt for open relationships to satisfy their sexual needs while being fully committed to each other emotionally. When it comes to sex in relationships, the bottom line is that you have to decide what's right for you. There are no cookie-cutter answers. It all depends on the importance that you personally place on sex. 
If you're unhappy in a sexless relationship, try communicating with your partner to express your feelings. You may even seek support from a professional to determine what's holding you back. Relationships are complicated, so having an expert in your corner can help provide the guidance you need to move forward. There were a few things that were mentioned in this and when, you know, is sex important? And for me personally, yes. You know, I don't like that. You know, when you first get together with somebody and it's like sex all the time, that's all it is. La, 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 la. And then the regularly, and the, this is what happens a lot of times too with people who are in a marriage and then start to seek outside the marriage. Their love life with their spouse, things have changed. It's not the way it was. Children, stress, money. And then you see somebody and you start having an affair and it's wild and crazy and great. But what happens if you leave the marriage and you go with this person? Chances are it may eventually get to that same cycle where life and work and all those things get in the way. And that original feeling of um, excitement kind of goes away. You love this person and you're with this person and you can't wait, you know, imagine being without them. But that whole excitement, limerence, all that stuff is no longer there. So in order to keep that excitement going, you cheat, you cheat, you cheat. Hello, I'm talking about myself here. Um, but um, I do feel that it is important and I do what I can, whether it works or not. Um to always want to keep that, remember that initial feeling of everything when you first got together with this person and keep trying to bring it back, you know, and keep that because I think it's important. That was my part. And then also the fact that they say there is no right or wrong answer. There's no cookie cutter. It is. It's like, well, you should be having sex three to five times a week. Who said you know, right? That's not, we've never done that. We've always done it this way or whatever. So it is, I think, subjective based on who it's about. So I appreciate that article. Um, I did get um, some um, listener experiences and opinions sent to me. So we'll get started with that. And this is this first Um, He is a definite supporter of the podcast, and I appreciate him sending this in. And uh, he knows who he is because he'll hear this and know it's his story. (laughs) Perfect. He's a Patreon subscriber. He's bought merch. I just really appreciate him more than he knows. All right. So he wrote, we were married five years when our second child was born by C-section. The doctor advised no sex for six weeks. I waited a year before initiating intimacy for the first time. I noticed that it was always me that initiated sex and was often turned down. I put it down to having two young kids and both working full time. Slowly over time, it really started to get to me. After four years, we had sex a total of five times. I was miserable. I got frustrated and angry over nothing. I felt used, unwanted, like a housemate in my own home. I would be laying in the bed beside my wife and feel lonely. When I asked for sex, at the weekend, say, it would be received with enthusiasm, but the weekend would come and go with nothing or excuses of sorts. It really started to build a wall between us and it became awkward and uncomfortable to approach the subject. My wife is wonderful and we can talk about anything, but when I mentioned sex, she would get defensive or walk away. She said she didn't want sex because I was angry or in bad form, but I was angry and in bad form because we weren't having sex. I offered to see a therapist. She refused. Eventually, I had enough and I had told her over and over again that I wasn't staying in a sexless marriage. On Christmas Eve, I called to my mother's to collect gifts and ended up having a huge fight over nothing. I came home and burst into tears. I was done. I think this really scared my wife into the seriousness of the problem. We started having sex again and again. Now we have sex four times a month and other fun things in between. We haven't went 10 days without sex since that Christmas, and my wife will often initiate it. We are both so much happier, and a marriage is great. Sex is so important to a relationship. 
If the minimum needs of a high libido partner aren't met by the low libido partner, then the one-sided relationship is going to be a deeply unhappy one. Thank you for sending that in. I appreciate how you put it, and, and I agree with you completely on what you said. All right, so the next one was a conversation um, between people, and I had printed it out, and I'm tr- not going to use names, but um, I just will go through this as best as I can. <laughs> So this is a conversation that actually ended up being between, I think, three people or four people. So a husband wrote, I lasted 25 years in a marriage of sex twice a year. I waited till my children were grown. Probably a big mistake, but that's what I did. And I asked him, did you step out of the marriage during that time? And he replied, unfortunately, I did. People have needs and desires. Uh, and he said it's not something he's proud of, but it happened when we need to ex- and we but it happened and we need to accept responsibility for our failures. I'm still friends with my ex-wife and our relationship now is better than when we were married, but that took five years of healing and forgiveness. And then another person popped in saying, uh, it sounds like you take ownership and do not blame shift. Similar situation, and I stepped out, but we are still married one time and 16 years ago. I own it. I think he's saying that he did it one time during their 16 years of marriage. No, 16 years ago is when he did it, and they're still married, and he did it once. She would have every right to know, and I'm not telling her, and to leave me. And then he said back to this person, From what I've learned, women have a lot more chances to have an affair than men do. And another female popped in and said, I believe that to be true, but always thought the opposite. My ex traveled a lot and I was home with the kids. So I'm taking that as if she's saying that her husband could have cheated easier because she was at home with the kids. How was she going to do it? And then um, a person comes back to her and said, I guess every relationship and every person is different. Life is complicated. Peace, love, and happiness. So that was a little conversation there, if you could follow it, but very interesting. Someone else said, that's a tough one to answer on so many levels. It's never that easy. And another one, I don't know, but in any meaningful committed relationship, sex needs to be there. It all depends on the people involved, how frequently. I forget where I heard it, but marriages and relationships without sex are friendships. So the original question that I had put out was, can you live with a sexless relationship or marriage? So because of that, this person came back and said, oh, for about five minutes, LOL. It actually depends if there's a deeper issue that we can work through or not. Next one was, unless there's a good reason that sex isn't happening and it's strictly just the person not wanting to be with me sexually, then it would probably take less than six months for me to walk away. I feel that amount of time would be plenty to acknowledge that there's an issue as well as an attempt to address and resolve it. I do my part to fix things, but I refuse to stay where I am not wanted and intimacy and sex are fairly important to me. And a comment to that post was, great answer. Sometimes there are reasons that occur beyond lack of desire. And I like what these people said. I I agree with that as well. The next one says, my challenge isn't that my wife will not have sex with me. She just will not stop having sex with my cousin. So if you're a Patreon subscriber, you will have heard um, the story from Joseph. Um, And he had talked about um, his wife. They are still intimate often, but she's been having an affair now for about a year and a half or two years, maybe even longer with his cousin. And he's not telling her he knows. He knows all the details and everything, but he's keeping it quiet. And uh, I've tried to explain to him that he does deserve to be happy. And if this isn't making him happy, he has the right to change that. But he's afraid of the upset on the family and, you know, what would happen with the divorce. And it's it's sad because I, uh, I think she knows he knows. And I just don't think that she cares. 
anyway, you can catch that story on Patreon, like I said. Okay, so the next one says, I went without for the better half, okay, I let me start over. I went without for the better half of 10 years, and I left after being married for 20 and together for 30. And that was a lady. And uh, a gentleman uh, came back and said, did you guys communicate a lot? I know I talked to my wife till I was blue in the face. Yeah, that that's common. I really think a lot of people are saying, hey, 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 they don't want to split up the marriage. Hey, 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 this is important to me. And, and uh, it just doesn't always work out. Um, a next person said, I won't last long, maybe a year. And then um, the next person said, well, that's why men cheat. Then the wife finally figured it out. Poor girlfriend stuck in the middle. I do not know what that one was about, but that's apparently what happened there. Okay, next one said, great ponder question. I have been married 18 years as of this month, and our first year was no sex, including wedding night. She was a three-hole wonder dating, but less than missionary Mary after we got married. Obviously, I am here for a reason, and it's not because of her. I made the transgression. I own it, and it was after about a year dry. I have been told I was seduced and taken advantage of, but again, I own it. It's not, it just happened, or, well, she would not put out. I should have ended things. So, I can say 18 years. Dating, if I am single again, I will say that if the sex drives don't match, someone will not be happy. So, I would not just cut and run. But if there's no satisfaction, then I would end it. And I'm not even saying great sex, just simply make the effort. I do think infidelity occurs more often than ending marriages over this issue. A dead bedroom is one of the reasons that I can understand why someone would cheat, but I don't make excuses for it or on my own. That's great. Thank you. Um, Let's see here. This one says, depends. Is it the first time we're having it or is it something being withheld after having been part of a part of the relationship? If she wants to wait until marriage, I fully respect that and will happily walk that way with her and focus on taking our time to get to know one another. If it's being withheld by a sexual partner as a manipulation technique, it's out immediately. That's a form of abuse. If the partner is just disinterested and we're dating, then maybe it's a sign that things have run its course. If we're married, uh, we seek counseling because a long-term drought in sex indicates underlying issues. Appreciate that. Thank you. Really depends on how much you care for them emotionally. All right, true. I would say that the other partner who is turning down the sex has some issues they need to address. There is a reason behind as to why. And that seems to be a common factor with people are saying there's a lot, there's something else going on. And the last one is here, how often is often enough? My husband and I have sex maybe 10 to time 12, 10 to 12 times a year. That is not nearly enough for me and he knows it. I have been pretty honest about it, but it remains the same. So I don't know how long because I have no intention of leaving. I appreciate that candid comment. And it was kind of like what we talked about earlier. You know, it's subjective. It's maybe this is okay for this couple or not. But this woman, she loves her spouse. She wants to stay with him. She wants more sex. But to her, the relationship is valued more than just intimacy there's more to it i appreciate everybody sending that in you know if you ever have an idea for a ponder episode let me know i have um a couple in the works and again i'm still looking for military infidelity meaning if you were an active member in the military and you found yourself cheating often Um, or had cheated while you were deployed, or if you were a military wife or husband staying home and you were lonely and you found yourself stepping out, I want to know a little bit about it. I want to understand, I, you know, as you guys know, the Marine, this actually happened with him and his first wife. He was not unfaithful, but she was. And eventually I'm going to talk with him a little bit more about that. But 
Oh, and bring him on the show. But in the meantime, I would love to get people's little stories of what happened. It doesn't have to be a full story, just little, you know, I was deployed, this is what happened. It doesn't have to be a huge thing like a normal story would be. Just um, just a summary. So uh, please send that in, or if you have any other ideas, um, other ones. Amount of partners you've had, do you think, do number of partners matter as far as who you were with or who your partner was with prior to you? You want to know the truth? Do you want to know the real number? Do you want to be lied to? Uh, does it make you uncomfortable? I mean, what 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 do you guys think about numbers um, of partners and where you are today? And you know, basically, how relevant is it to you or your spouse based on that? So that is another one. So keep them coming. These are a lot of ideas from people. So I want to hear them keep coming and we'll keep working at it. So in the meantime, wish me luck for my surgery. And thank you guys so much for all your support. You have been listening to Raw Truth Stories of Female Infidelity. Your support of the podcast is truly appreciated. Be sure to visit my website at rawtruthstoriesoffemaleinfidelity.com to access story guides, subscribe to Patreon for bonus episode of the men's side of female infidelity, and to vote for this podcast to be in the Hot 50 Countdown for Podcast Magazine. To submit your story for the show, share feedback, or if you have a Let's Ponder suggestion, please email it to rebecca.rawtruth at gmail.com or send by snail mail to Rebecca Adams, P.O. Box 821064, Vancouver, Washington, 98682. Every story is always anonymous. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, please rate and review the show. Raw Truth Stories of Female Infidelity is produced and edited by Rebecca Adams. You can follow the show on Facebook at Raw Truth Stories of Female Infidelity, on Instagram at Podcast Raw Truth, and on Twitter at Raw Female. Thank you again, and be kind to one another. Be kind to yourself, and always remember, no judgment. Goodbye. Goodbye.